Hello, everyone. I'm here in California, so it's about 5 p.m., and I'm pleased to spend this time with you. I'm Dr. Susan Hutchinson, and I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Mig American Migraine Foundation. I'm somewhat unique because even though I'm a headache specialist, my background is not neurology. For 22 years, I was family medicine. And when you're a female family medicine provider, you do a lot of gynecology. You see a lot of women. You make a lot of decisions about hormones. So when I was asked to present and be a panelist for this topic of migraine and menopause, it was very easy for me to say yes. I feel, and I'm gonna guess most of you agree, that if you are treating a female in a headache practice, you have to know what's going on hormonally. And I think that's where I come in. There's a lot of neurologists that actually refer to me because they don't quite understand the connection of women, hormones, and migraine. And that's been a passion of mine for many years. So in a nutshell, my background is family medicine, 22 years. Then I became so passionate about headache, I went back for extra training. So I'm UCNS certified in headache medicine. In 2007, I founded Orange County Migraine and Headache Center here in Irvine, California. So my practice now is limited to headache and mood disorders, but I also do a lot of hormonal treatment to help women with migraine. And that's one of the reasons this topic is so near and dear to me. But I am very careful. and I try to closely collaborate with the gynecologist and or the primary care provider. So the topic tonight is migraine and menopause. Um, I do want to make this interactive and have plenty of time for questions, so I purposely have kept the slides as a backdrop of just eight total slides. So I think it's important to make sure we're all on the same page, so I'd like to go through some definitions. And that is, let's talk about what is perimenopause versus menopause. What is this term called surgical menopause? And is there a difference between early menopausal years versus later menopausal years? Because I think the approach to migraine can vary depending on where we are at in that time frame. So let's talk about perimenopause. Now the average age of perimenopause is probably 47, 51 years old. However, it can start earlier in the 40s. And if it starts really early before 40, it would be considered premature perimenopause. But what's characteristic of perimenopause is just this wide fluctuation in estrogen and progesterone from the ovaries. And so what happens is there's a change from a younger woman who has a regular menstrual cycle, let's say every 28 days, and let's say that woman, like some of you, may have had a pretty predictable menstrual migraine, and maybe it was, you know, once a month. And there it was probably a little easier to incorporate some short-term preventive strategies to really target that vulnerable time of the month. But then when perimenopause hits, again, on average, mid to late 40s, all of a sudden the periods can be all over the place. They could be further apart, they can be closer together. So it's a little harder to know when do you start your short-term preventive strategy if you have menstrual migraine, or even some people have migraines at ovulation. You know, it's a little harder to figure that out. And again, the periods can be closer together, they can be further apart. The problem too is often there can be starting hot flashes, night sweats, and unfortunately insomnia. And that's a real problem because when you think about insomnia, that's interfering with sleep as is hot flashes and night sweats and certainly not having good sleep that can be a trigger for having the migraines get out of control there also could be an increase in depression and irritability and i will tell you having treated many many women over many many years in both family medicine and OBGYN practice and now a headache practice is that Perimenopause can be an incredible challenging time as migraines often get really out of control. And many women in my practice have been frustrated and saying, why is these different treatments that were working, they're not working as well anymore? And I think it's because you've got these ups and downs in hormones. 
sometimes we can quiet it down with getting more aggressive with prevention. And as you know, there's a lot of good targeted when we talk about calcitonin gene related peptide treatments. I'm sure many of you listening have heard of them, but I'm thinking about the injectables, things like Amovig, Ajovi, Engaldi, there's IV Viepti, and now we have oral Culipta, we have oral Nurtec. But the point is that a woman who maybe didn't need prevention or she was just on a single preventive agent, when she hits perimenopause, she may need a more aggressive preventive approach. Now that treatment could include hormone management, but nevertheless, I think the mainstay for prevention during perimenopause is still going to be primarily your evidence-based migraine preventive treatments. So now let's talk about menopause. What is the actual definition of menopause? Well, it's the cessation of spontaneous menses. And what do I mean by that? This would mean, this would refer to a woman who was not on a hormone or a birth control pill. So in other words, let's say a woman for one full year, a full 12 months, she has no spontaneous bleeding and she's not on hormones. That is the definition of menopause. Now, blood tests are not necessary to make the definition. However, in some cases over the years, I do order blood work. And the most common example would be, let's say a woman is, I don't know, let's say she's in her early 50s. She hasn't had a period for three, four, six months. So she doesn't quite meet the criteria for menopause, but she's wondering, is she perimenopause or more menopause? So if blood tests are done and that confirmation is necessary, what you're looking for to confirm menopause is a markedly elevated, it's called follicle stimulating hormone, also known as FSH. That comes from the pituitary gland. And when your body senses that there's not enough estrogen being produced by the ovary, then the FSH goes high. And when I talk about high, it depends on the reference lab for that particular laboratory, but normally you're looking at an FSH over 30, and then you're looking at a low estradiol level, and that would be the, 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 the predominant estrogen. So when you have those two, that helps confirm menopause. But kind of a quick, very insightful story, and a true one, is that I had a woman many years ago come into my busy primary care setting. She's a Dr. Hutchinson. I haven't had a period in about three or four months. I'm wondering if I'm menopausal. Well, guess what? We did the blood test. Instead of being low, her estradiol was very, very high. Do you know why? She was pregnant. So a word of caution, many women, when they're perimenopausal, they think, oh, there's no way I could get pregnant, and they stop doing consistent birth control. So another reason it's important to know if you're perimenopausal versus menopause is to make sure you're not still vulnerable for a pregnancy. Now, I'm happy to report this young woman in her early 50s, she still did go on and have the pregnancy and carry it through, and she was happy about it. That was a very interesting when I got that back, and I was expecting the blood test to show that she was menopausal. Instead, she was pregnant. So what are we going to expect with migraine with menopause? Well, the hope is that migraine will improve because you're starting to move away from the ups and downs and crazy fluctuations that you have when you're perimenopausal. So think about the ovaries as being quiet, going to sleep. Now, that sounds good because you don't have the ups and downs, but one of my colleagues in the headache world, Dr. Vince Martin, he did some work and found that for some women when they're menopausal, there can be an absolute low level of estrogen. For some women, too low of estrogen, that can be a trigger for migraine. And plus, remember, the majority of women that are going to get much better with migraine when they're menopausal, those, the, those are the women that have had a strong hormonal trigger to their migraines over the years. If you have other strong triggers, for example, in my practice, changes in barometric pressure, that's a huge trigger. Uh, stress levels can be a trigger, lack of sleep. You know, uh, I had a patient today when she goes to a restaurant or grocery store, just, just the smell, the, the different smells that when she's out in her environment. So, Obviously, when a woman's menopausal, 
she's eliminated the trigger of the ups and downs and hormones, but you still have all the other triggers in your life. So if a woman only had a hormonal trigger, there is a type of menstrual migraine called pure menstrual migraine. And that would be where women over the years only have a migraine at the time of their period, thought to be due to that drop in estrogen just before menses. That's the subgroup of women that would definitely be expected to have improvement in their migraine when they become menopausal. But again, the majority of women over the years have had what's called menstrual related migraine. So yes, they have migraines triggered by menses, but they also have migraines from many other triggers. So I'm sure we'll have questions that come in about this. So you know, I have had women, by the way, frustrated because they thought, oh, I finally hit menopause. Why do I still have migraines, Dr. Hutchinson? And because, you know, they, they kept hoping, they kept being told over the years they'll go away. Well, in some cases they do, but often they don't completely go away or get better until you're later in the menopausal years. So now what I want to touch on, you may have heard this term. There is a term called surgical menopause. And this is where the ovaries are taken out or removed before a woman has gone through what I call natural menopause. So there's surgical versus spontaneous or natural. And there's many different reasons ovaries could be removed. Um, it could be because there are some cysts. Some women have something called torsion, so the ovaries get twisted. A lot of different reasons. Um, unfortunately, some are removed because they have breast cancer. So what that's going to do when, if the ovaries are taken out before a woman has gone through spontaneous menopause, boy, the implications for having migraine exacerbation are incredible. Because what you've done is you've gone from these fluctuations as part of menses and all of a sudden you've taken out the ovaries and boy, the estrogen and progesterone are just gonna plummet. And that can throw a woman into not just migraine exacerbation, but depression. Um, I've seen a lot of mood swings. And so if any of you are facing surgical menopause, try to come up with a treatment plan, maybe have a collaborative approach between your gynecologist who's going to be doing the ovarian removal with your headache doctor to kind of come up with a game plan. Because again, when you go through, in fact, I've heard it quoted before that if women go through spontaneous menopause, about two thirds should be expected to have their migraines improve. If women are thrown into menopause by having their ovaries removed before they have gone through menopause, only about a third may improve. So uh, the implications are huge. And speaking of that, some of you may have had gynecological uh, uh, conditions, I would say that, let's say you've got some fibroids of your uterus. And if you are given the question, okay, you need to have your uterus taken out. Do you want your ovaries taken out as well, or do you want them left in? Often the argument for having them taken out as well, you'll never have to worry about ovarian cancer, but the argument against it is it's gonna throw you into menopause. So I would suggest if the reason any of you need to have your uterus taken out is not cancer, maybe it's something like fibroids, and if you're given the choice, I would say have your ovaries left in, allow yourself to go through menopause spontaneously, since that will be less of a problem with migraine in general. So now I wanna focus on, we've, we've mentioned these terms before, but we talk about early versus later menopausal years, because this has, I think, very strong implications for looking at risk versus benefit uh, ratio in, in thinking about hormones. Cause I'm, I'm gonna guess some of you join because you're trying to make decisions about whether to go on hormones yourself. So when we talk about early menopause, the average age of menopause is about 51. And again, by definition, no spontaneous menses for a full 12 months. So the average age is about 51, 52. So generally between that and 60, those are considered the early menopausal years. And for many women, whether you have migraine or not, for many of you, the benefits of hormonal therapy often outweigh the risks. Now, the main indication for going on hormones is not to help your migraines, that would be a side benefit. 
but the main reason to consider hormones would be the following. If, you, if a woman has very uncomfortable, we call them vasomotor symptoms, also known as VMS, and generally that would refer to hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, and it can be quite miserable, and I've gone through it myself, so I certainly know that feeling. Also, there can be genital urinary symptoms of menopause that can be quite uncomfortable, and part of that is due to dryness because of the lack of estrogen. And then certainly also for women at high risk of osteoporosis, which in particular would be slender women, European descent, Caucasian. Those women are at higher risk. And you also want to think about family history. You know, did your mother get hunched over and have, you know, vertebral fractures in her back, hip fractures? These are the indications. Now, where did I draw this information? This, is, this comes directly from North American Menopause Society. They've recently updated their guidelines and it's a free website and you simply go to menopause.org. Again, menopause.org, a lot of good information. So as you know, there's been a lot of controversy in hormones over the years. And just as a reference point, some of you may be too young to remember this, but I'm 66 and a half, so I'm probably older than many of you. There was a study called the Women's Health Initiative, and they were looking at women who were on hormones, and in particular, they, they were looking at Premarin and Provera. Keep in mind that Premarin and Provera are synthetic. Premarin, the name Premarin comes from pregnant mares, so it came from pregnant horses. And then there was a synthetic progesterone called Provera. And what they found in the Women's Health Initiative, there were a lot of cardiovascular and there was some stroke risk and there were so many things happening that they actually stopped the study short. And it really threw, you know, OBGYN practices, me who was doing a lot of well woman exams, it just threw everyone for a loop because like, oh my goodness, all we've been doing hormones for years, is it not so good? Well, there's been a lot of criticism of the study and it looks like that part of the problem could be the, the type of hormones that were used, which were Premarin and Provera, but also it was women that often had not been on hormones and then were started on hormones maybe at the age of 60. So that is not a good idea. So those of you listening, if you're earlier in your menopausal years, the benefits of hormonal therapy often outweigh the risk, but certainly we need to take into account other issues with your health. Now let's contrast this with what I call the later menopausal years. And in general, this would refer to women like myself that are over 60 years old. So if we're getting up in our years and we're in our 60s, then we need to relook at this risk benefit ratio and it may be less favorable for starting on hormones. Why? There is a risk when we go on hormones, increased risk of coronary heart disease, stroke, venous thromboembolism, which would be like a clot, for example, in your, uh, very often in the calf, and then dementia. So again, when looking back at the Women's Health Initiative, when they really started analyzing the data, it was the group of women that had not been on hormones early in menopause, and they were put on them as part of the study. And so they were started on it in their later menopausal years, and that's when they stopped the study. But again, we, we don't tend to use Premarin and Provera as much anymore. In fact, I don't use it at all. So the attitude of the North American Menopause Society, as well as my own personal belief, is if we use preparations that are more natural, I know some providers don't like the word bioidentical, but transdermal would be an example, would be the patch. There's, there's estradiol patches, and some of you may be using them, and they have come in different doses, but basically you put them on your lower abdomen, it's kind of like a Band-Aid, so the estradiol goes directly from the skin into the blood system. It bypasses the GI system and you can get a very nice steady state estrogen level. And that actually can be measured with a blood test to help guide the provider and you as far as going up and down. There's also topical gels. There's a popular one called Divi Gel. And going back to the patches, that's the most common type of hormone replacement therapy that I prescribe. And again, I make sure the woman is keeping up with her well woman exams, her pap smear, her mammogram,
but I really like the estrogen patches. And I think for many women, it helps them sleep. It can help their mood. I think in many cases, it can help prevent migraine by keeping the estrogen nice and even. And also the Women's Health Initiative realized that not only does the formulation make a difference by using natural estradiol, which means it's the same chemical molecular structure as your own ovaries produced when you were younger, and also using micronized natural progesterone. Uh, in other words, moving away from the synthetic Provera. Um, also, some women, you've probably heard of this, some women are actually getting um, pellets. They will get pellets inserted in their buttocks that maybe have estrogen in them and testosterone. Now, just a word about natural progesterone. I really like plain natural progesterone, but it's too large of a molecule to be put in that form in a patch. So that's why if women still have a uterus in, and let's say a woman has migraine, but she would really like to be on hormones because of hot flashes, night sweats, prevention of osteoporosis, and I would do an estradiol patch, and in most cases, progesterone, 100 milligram as a capsule taken nightly. One of the advantages of natural progesterone taken in the evening is that it can often help a woman sleep, as does the estrogen. And if, an I, if I can help a woman who's menopausal feel better, get better sleep, that is going to help her migraine as well. And in most cases, if I use natural estradiol in the form of a patch or a gel and natural progesterone, in my experience, it's very rare that it's going to negatively affect her migraine. On the other hand, if I use synthetic conjugated Premarin, synthetic progesterone, there's a good chance it could aggravate the migraine and increase the risk of some of the other health issues that were concerning in what we call the Women's Health Initiative. I'm just looking at my uh, watch because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions, and I think we will, and I'm very happy about that. So let's talk about, again, migraine implications. Because many of you may have a primary care provider and or a gynecologist, and yet separately you have a headache doctor. So if you listening are having a lot of migraines and you're frustrated and you're perimenopausal or menopausal, I don't think hormones should be the first line of treatment. I think you still need to look at the evidence-based standard migraine preventives. And again, we have, a, we have so many options now. You know, you've got the generic oral preventives like the anti-epileptics, the blood pressure medications, the antidepressants, and in fact, just a word, there are a few of what we call the antidepressants that actually can help hot flashes. So sometimes when we're picking a preventive, we say, can we have a twofer? So if I have a woman who's perimenopausal and having hot flashes, I might use, for example, venlafaxine, which you may know as a fexor. There's some data it can help prevent hot flashes, and it also has good evidence in preventing migraine. Some of the SSRIs, we call them selective serotonin receptor uptake inhibitors, things like paroxetine, which is Paxil. There's actually a form of it called Brisdale that's FDA approved for hot flashes. So the point is we can use some of the standard evidence-based preventives if we're trying to prevent migraine and help hot flashes. But if you are having significant vasomotor symptoms like hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, or if you're having significant genitourinary symptoms due to the loss of estrogen, or you would like prevention of osteoporosis based on a very strong family history or high risk personally, then I think hormonal therapy would, would, could be useful. But just to reiterate, I think it's safer if it's started in the earlier menopausal years, and also the general consensus is use the lowest dose necessary for the shortest amount of time. So I think for many of you, maybe that amount of time would be three to five years. The first three to five years of menopause, get the benefits for your bones and your hair and your skin and, and get the sleep you need. And then you may not need hormones as you start moving into your later menopausal years over 60. I stand before you or sit before you and I'm not on hormones. I did when I was early menopausal, but I seem to be doing fine. I rarely get a migraine now. 
And when I do it, it's a combination of things like stress, lack of sleep, and travel. Now, anytime any of your providers either starts hormonal therapy or changes it, and that could be your primary care provider, it could be your gynecologist, in some cases the headache doctor, please, please carefully monitor what happens to your migraine. You know, do your migraines get better? Is there a new onset aura, which would be a concern? Are your migraines getting worse? Are they about the same? So anytime hormones are changed, please carefully monitor what's happening by, again, looking at whether it's electronic or on paper, looking at your diary. So um, I believe that is my last slide. Uh, this is a topic of great interest, so you know I'm happy to continue to make a few points, but I also want to get to your questions, and I'm so glad that so many of you have taken time to, to listen. Um, again, here in California, it's only about 5.30. For some of you back east, it's probably already 8.30. So I, I do see a question coming in, which I, I love the question part of it. Okay, but here's the question. How do I treat a woman that was thrown into menopause at a younger age with tamoxifen and then went through it spontaneously? That is a great question. Uh, tamoxifen is an anti-estrogen, and I'm almost confident that the only reason a woman will be put on tamoxifen is because of breast cancer. I need to be very careful with any woman who has a history of breast cancer. And as you know, there's some breast cancers that are estrogen receptor positive, some estrogen receptor negative. But I probably would not use anything with estrogen in that particular patient. In terms of what I would use for that woman, if she was having hot flashes, I might try then lefaxine, which is the generic for Effexor. I might try Brisdale, which has peroxetine in it. There's also a supplement I often use called relizin, and there's even some evidence for gabapentin. So I would probably try to take a standard migraine preventive that has good evidence in preventing migraine, but also try to help that woman if she was having some of those vasomotor symptoms. Having said that, I can still treat a woman who's been on tamoxifen in the past with some of our standard newer agents that target CGRP, so if, let's say, the venlafaxine, the paroxetine, let's say it helped her hot flashes, but she was still having a lot of migraines, I might offer that woman one of the CGRP monoclonal antibodies like Amovig, Ajovium, Gality, or I might offer her the daily Culipta or the Nortec every other day. And then we have another question coming in. Great, great question. Are hormones contraindicated for women with vestibular migraine? The, shorter answer, the short answer is no. And in fact, as women get older, I see more and more of this vestibular migraine pattern. And sometimes the, the vestibular symptoms come with the migraine, sometimes they occur randomly. And treatment really varies for that particular woman. It can vary, but hormones would not be contraindicated. Um, as a side note, sometimes just for quick relief, if a woman gets a vestibular migraine, sometimes we actually do a little bit of diazepam, which is Valium, a very low dose, and sometimes that can help. Um, I have a wonderful place here in Southern California that I can refer women with vestibular migraine, and sometimes they can do some vestibular rehab exercises that can make a difference. And just to learn more about it, you can go to the, it's a fun website, it's called dizzyland.com. But yes, I think we're starting to realize in the headache world that vestibular migraine is probably more common than we used to think it was. Uh, what if migraines get worse after menopause and you can't take hormones? Again, you know, if you can't take hormones, and the most common reason would be because of personal or strong family history, let's say breast, ovarian, or uterine cancer. Again, I think I'm gonna answer that in two different ways. I think if you're trying to deal with the vasomotor symptoms of menopause, then again, I, as I mentioned, you could do the venlafaxine, you could try the Brisdale, you could try Relizin, you could try Gabapentin. You could even try, there's over-the-counter things like black cohosh, red clover, soy, although even soy for some women is not supposed to be taken if they have a history of cancer. So you can use supplements or some of the standard preventives for the vasomotor. 
But if that woman can't take estrogen, but she's still getting a lot of migraine again, I really like these new targeted CGRP treatments. I use a lot of the injectables and I've been very happy with Qlipta once a day or Nortec, N-U-R-T-E-C, every other day. Those are oral CGRP uh, receptor antagonists. So I, I think we're finding that for most patients with migraine, if we target CGRP, uh, it really could make a difference. And I, I have patients that just have their life back. It's, it's just amazing. So this person is asking, um, and thank you, Lynn, is Activella a natural or synthetic? Well, guess what? It's a little bit of both. When you see, that's a great question. When you see estradiol, that is natural. It's bioidentical to what your own ovaries used to produce, which I love. The problem is the norethendra, which is in it, is a synthetic progestin or progesterone. And that's a very common progesterone that's in birth control pills. Now, having said that, would Activella be okay? Well, it may be. If I had a woman, let's say, she doesn't want to do the estradiol patch, maybe because it irritates her skin. I'm okay if I have a woman who has migraine, who's menopausal, if she wants to go on Activella, but I would have her carefully watch, not just the pattern of her, her migraine, but also her mood because sometimes synthetic progesterone can adversely affect the mood. So I would have that woman watch for, do her migraines get better or worse or about the same on the Activella? And is her mood okay? So again, the estrogen part is natural, but the norethendrone is synthetic. I uh, really appreciate these questions coming in. This makes it much more fun. So Gwen says, can I discuss the role of isoflavins in helping to alleviate the effects of low estrogen? Great question. And can I please discuss St. John's wort in combination with black cohosh to help with mood and hot flashes? Yeah, great question. So yes, there are a number of supplements that can help. And I, I personally feel, and again, I did many years of women's health, I think the ones that have the most evidence in helping the vasomotor symptoms like hot flashes and night sweats would be soy, uh, red clover, black cohosh, to some degree St. John's wort. And what, what when we think about the, the, there's a term called phytoestrogens, and those are plant-based sources that have estrogen-like activity. So they're not estrogen, but they can act like estrogen and help you relieve those symptoms of hot flashes and night sweats. Now, one warning about the St. John's wort. You have to be very careful if you were also to be put on a, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Paxil, Prozac, Zoloft, or Lexapro. You'd also have to be careful if you were put on something like Effexor or Cymbalta because you're increasing the risk of something called serotonin syndrome. That's, it's very rare, but just be very careful. So again, the St. John's wort is a little different than what I call the isoflavins or the phytoestrogens. So a little bit more drug interactions with the St. John's wort. Having said that, I have some women that take St. John's wort alone for their depression or their mood. And I'm okay with that as long as they're not also taking a prescription antidepressant. So great question. Um, but yes, you could do you could do St. John's wort with black cohosh. You could do it with red clover. You could do it with soy. But for those of you that have a history of breast cancer, you would want to clear it with your oncologist because some breast cancer specialists don't like soy itself because it has too much estrogen-like activity, and the potential is could it increase risk of the breast cancer coming back? So you just have to be careful. I also mentioned there's a supplement, and I have no stock in any of these companies to reassure you, but there is a supplement called Relizen, R-E-L-I-Z-E-N, and it comes from a Swedish flower extract, and it has evidence-based in placebo-controlled double-blind studies that it can relieve hot flashes and night sweats superior to placebo. And there was a very notable gynecologist here in Newport Beach, and he did a dinner program, and I thought, he's not going to risk his reputation on something that he doesn't believe in. Um, I, when my patients take it, they order it online, but it's R-E-L-I-Z-E-N, 
and it would be safe in women that have had a history of breast cancer. So um, I think, let's see, well, I think we're doing pretty good. We still have time for some more questions and these are great questions coming in. Uh, maybe I can just mention a couple other thoughts as we're waiting for any more questions that come in. If a woman is perimenopausal, and let's say she's still having periods, but they're irregular, and she's having hot flashes, and she comes in and sees me, and she might say, Dr. Hutchinson, can you put me on the estrogen patch or some estrogen gel? If you go on traditional hormone therapy, but you're perimenopausal, you're only adding a layer of estrogen. You still have the ups and downs and fluctuation. So if I am going to use a hormonal approach to help a woman who's perimenopausal, I'm going to probably have to go with a low dose contraceptive birth control pill, or there is something called the Nuva Ring. And why? Because we need to quiet the ovaries down. If you're simply adding a layer of estrogen, let's say with an estrogen patch, you're still going to have the wide fluctuations. So sometimes what I do in those women that are perimenopausal, I'll use a very low dose oral contraceptive. And you know, over the years, the doses have gotten lower and lower. And we now have one that is called low, low estrogen. It only has 10 micrograms of ethanyl estradiol. Compare that with when I first started practice, we actually had birth control pills. Some of you may remember this, Orthonova 180, Orthonova 150. We had birth control preparations that had 50 to 80 micrograms of ethanyl estradiol. So now that we have these much lower dose preparations, I think we need to revisit some of the, um, you know, there's been some arbitrary, I think, comments over the years from OBGYN organizations about not using hormones in women that have migraine. And I think that's simply not true. You can't lump all women together. But for those of you listening, I do think you wanna be a little careful, a little more careful if you have what's called migraine with aura. Migraine with aura is characterized by attacks in which there are reversible neurological signs and symptoms that occur before the headache itself. Most common, it's visual. It could be wavy lines, zigzag lines, loss of vision, uh, you know, shimmering lights. Some cases, it's numbness or tingling on one side of the body. It could be slurred speech. So if you're getting aura, I think we have to tread a little bit more carefully when we talk about hormone replacement therapy and menopause. Having said that, there's a big difference between a woman who's extremely healthy, has no risk factors for stroke or heart attack, and maybe she gets two uncomplicated visual aura a year, maybe for 20 minutes, versus a woman who has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, she's overweight, and she's getting a lot of aura. That woman I would not touch with estrogen. So I think, again, I think it's so important that we take an individualized approach to each and every one of you and also, that approach may change depending on whether you're perimenopausal, menopausal, and even that could change versus whether you're early versus late menopausal. So again, very individual approach. And also encourage you to try to foster that collaborative approach because I feel like I've been kind of a bridge in between, you know, many gynecologists know a lot about hormones, but they don't know a lot about migraine. And then you have a lot of male neurologists, they know a lot about headache, but they don't want to touch anything with hormones. So I think it's nice personally that I think there are more headache specialists that are coming from a family practice background. There's more female neurologists coming around because you want your gynecologist, your PCP to communicate with the headache doctor so you're all working together. And make sure when you're seeing your various providers, please make sure they know if any of your medications have changed even if you think that change has nothing to do with that particular physician, I'll give you a quick example. Some of the cholesterol lowering medications like the statins, I've seen it increase people's migraines. I've seen some medications used for gastrointestinal disorders increase migraines. So sometimes a medication that you're put on by another provider may be flaring up your migraines. So you need your headache specials to know about that. So I'm gonna now take a look and see if there's any more questions coming in. I'm just gonna scroll down. I don't think I see any more. And let's see, we're about 
540. So I think I'm going to wait about five more minutes. I mean, I could talk about this all night. Um, I think for those of you that are wondering about hormone formulations, if you are listening and you're a woman who's menopausal and you're on hormones and you're wondering, should you change? Should you stick with what you're on? I would really encourage you to try to be, if you can, on preparations that especially the estrogen is estradiol. So the, the combination pill that a woman mentioned earlier, the Activella, I think it's more important that the estradiol be natural or bioidentical. But even with the natural progesterone, again, you have to be careful. Could that negatively affect the migraine or the mood? Years ago, I knew a female psychiatrist and her comment was synthetic progesterone and progestins can be a psychiatrist's worst nightmare. So always monitor your mood as well as your migraines when you are changing anything to do with your hormones. Um, and it makes me think about a patient that maybe some of you could relate to. I recently, I had not heard from a particular woman for quite a few years, and that's not uncommon if they're doing well and maybe their primary care is taking over migraine management. But in her case, she had been on some kind of hormonal preparation and then her gynecologist changed it. And there was about three different changes in what she was taking. And it really threw her for a loop for her migraines. So she got frustrated. She saw me and we took a different route. We said, you know what, let's do this. Let's stay away from hormones right now because you're, you're kind of getting to be, you know, 60, 61. And let's, let's treat your migraines with a standard evidence-based preventive. In this case, we used q -Lipta. And what it did, it just kind of calmed everything down. And now her decision is not to go back on hormones because she's not having hot flashes or night sweats. So again, just, just an example of where I think what happened is her gynecologist kept changing things. And you know, when we're migraine patients, we don't like change. Typically, we don't like change in hormones. And unfortunately, when we become menopausal, we have no choice. Our ovaries are just going to stop producing, you know, estrogen and progesterone. And so like it or not, we are all at some point going to have to enter and then be in menopause. But I can tell you it's, it's a good time in my life. I'm happy <clears throat> and I'm, I'm looking forward to this last, <clears throat> I guess, one third of my life. Um, I just went with my husband to his 50th college reunion for UCSD. So we were, I was surrounded by <clears throat> men and women that were 71 and 72, and how gratifying that many of them looked good and looked like they were still living very full lives. So let me just take a moment and see if there's any more questions coming in, but you've been a great audience. I think it looks like well over 100 that has joined us. Okay, here's another question. Um, are the estradiol supplements okay with those who have migraine with or due to stroke risk? I think I answered that to some degree. Again, I really would want to know more about that woman's pattern with aura. There is a term called simple aura. And by definition, that would be aura that lasts less than 60 minutes. It completely goes away and then the woman gets the headache. And sometimes you can get aura without the headache. So if a woman had uncomplicated aura and it wasn't very frequent and her blood pressure was okay, she didn't have high cholesterol, she didn't have diabetes. In other words, I want that woman to not have other stroke risk factors. So if I had a woman in my practice that had no other stroke risk factors other than migraine with aura, there still has to be a reason, though, for me to put her on estrogen. She's got to be miserable with hot flashes or night sweats or vaginal dryness. I'm not going to do it just to help the migraine. But would I prescribe estrogen in that woman? Yes, I would. But I would monitor that woman very carefully once we started hormonal therapy. And I would, you know, want to make sure, is the aura getting worse, more frequent? Is it better? Um, so again, I think it's not contraindicated, but you just have to tread a little bit more carefully. You know, we, we control what we can, and I think, um, you know, the more we can control other risk factors, so important. Uh, does menopause increase migraine 
brain fog or memory issues? Well, since I'm kind of there, I would, I would say yes. I think that it's going to be more of a problem in those of you that have chronic migraine because when you have 15 or more days a month with migraine, I feel like it's almost like you're never completely getting better. And so those kind of patients in my practice, it's almost like they feel like they're in a fog all the time. And I think with, with menopause, when you don't have, if you've chosen not to go on estrogen, I think that can increase that, um, that brain fog. So, I think that's a real issue. Would estrogen help? That's debatable. Um, there has been some research showing estrogen helping some of the neuron and the different connections in the brain. And kind of an interesting story, years ago, I was going to write a book with a OBGYN and we were gonna talk about all the benefits of estrogen, including the brain. And as we were starting to write a book, that's when the Women's Health Initiative broke and there was a lot of controversy against estrogen. So um, again, I certainly can tell you that I have that brain fog at times. Um, so yes, I do, I do think that uh, menopause can increase that brain fog uh, that we already have with migraine. So great question. And it says, could I stop sharing my screen? I would be happy to stop sharing my screen. Okay, now it says no one sees my screen. Have I done what I'm supposed to do when I'm talking to the American Migraine Foundation? Okay, well, if, if all of you can hear me, um, I'm going to go ahead and wish everyone a very pleasant good evening. Um, I, I think the staff may need to say a few words or close you out, but I, I think we had incredible questions and I just thank you so much for your time and attention.